Hello everyone and welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd. Thank you for joining us for another hour of good gardening. If you've got a gardening question, dial 402-472-1212 if you live in Lincoln. Our toll-free number is 800-676-5446. Emails and pictures for a future show can be sent to byf at unl.edu. Tell us as much as you can, including where you live. You can follow Backyard Farmer during the week on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Pinterest. So Jody, it is could be plant of the week, but it's bug <laughs> of the week, right? Yeah, I would say this is probably the, the worst bouquet I've ever put together. But um, they're from my yard and also um, a garden in Omaha. So these are coneflowers and sunflowers, and they are infested with the sunflower moth. They're also called the sunflower head moth or the head moth. So, it's a caterpillar that eats the seeds and uh, really starts burrowing into the head. So it gets very difficult to control when they get old enough. But if you look how bad these are, it's gonna be like this thick webbing and frass. Um, I've been a little addicted trying to pick through them. Can, I don't know, Go they ahead. are yeah, super you're good. infested, but... Um, Whoa. Yeah, so you'll see the webbing, and when you pick that webbing off, you'll see worms moving around underneath. They do turn into a really uh, not very pretty moth, um, but these moths migrate from the south, and they do that in the middle of the night, basically, where we don't see it, and then lay eggs. So do you see any of those? Yeah, that's just, yeah. Lots well, of, worms. of course, just, yeah, just they're those. just crawling. So if you see the webbing, I would say prune those those heads off, um, because isn't there a there's a fungus that can occur right when <clears throat> when those seeds get opened up? But um, that's what's happening. There's not really um, going to help with controlling these ones because they're so messed up. But um, you know, if you've got some younger, smaller buds and you want to treat with BT, you can do that, and that will only affect the caterpillars and not any of the pollinators because the pollinators love these. So this is why I'm trying my best to pick them off and cut off their heads. <laughs> okay, thanks, Jody. <laughs> Okay, Matt, we have uh, weeds on steroids yes, again Yes, since we have you. bouquets of flowers, <laughs> I have bouquets of weeds. Uh, one of them needs a haircut, the other one is still pretty young. So uh, what I have here is prostrate spurge, and that's gonna become an, a big problem this time of year. The heat comes, and then the prostrate spurge comes in everybody's landscape beds or in the sidewalk cracks. Uh, and the main thing here is, uh, if you see the two samples here, they have, they're a summer annual, and they're gonna be popping up all over, especially if you had them last year and didn't control them, they're gonna be everywhere. Uh, so they start off pretty little. This is actually probably a couple weeks old already, but usually you see them when they're tiny and you're like, oh, they're not that big of a problem. Uh, they make a nice taproot, so they're pretty drought prone or they don't require that much water. And then they just spread. So a couple weeks later, if you look at the next one, you end up with a giant mop that can take up you know, two to three feet of space. And at this point, they're starting to set seed pods, and if you don't control them, that's gonna be a million more seeds for the next season. Uh, so the odds of controlling them uh, are a lot better when you do them when they're small. Um, a lot of the broadleaf herbicides do work on these. Uh, they're pretty simple to pull out. You wanna make sure you get the taproot. If you break the top off, then they will regrow. Uh, so there's a couple options there, but control them before they get too big. It sort of looks like a wig. Yes, it can also be a little wig, but it'll be all get seed all over your head. Okay, Lauren, you have the wimpiest sample today. Sorry, <laughs> it's a lot. Okay, well, you know how you know in the holiday time you say it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas, maybe. Well, I I feel that way about turf diseases right now. So there's lots of turf diseases out there. This is one that's just starting to come up. I got some just leaf blades to show you. Uh, brown patch and hopefully we can get a picture of this. We'll see how it goes. Yeah So you can see those irregular shaped margins and actually this one is kind of one of the earlier ones It's got a smoky color to it and then the one over here. I could never be a weather person um, Has that kind of light tan color to it with the dark margin Occasionally you'll get one that will actually go across the leaf blade with this It's unusual and that's one of the things we talk about for identifying dollar spot is that it would go across. But this time of year, if you see these darker margin lesions, irregular, most of the times not across the 
uh, leaf blade, and then you'll see them more prominent in when you have any type of uh, grass blade injury if, you're, if your uh, mower blade is a little bit dull like mine is at home. So uh, in any event, uh, this is the time of year you see, we're seeing a lot of it in fescue. It will go to bluegrass also. We're seeing some of it in bluegrass. Uh, it can be managed with a fungicide, although it's not absolutely necessary. Uh, but if you are trying to control it, uh, there are some homeowner products that are available with propiconazole, which is rated better than the mycobutanil product. And then the other one is there are some generic uh, azoxystrobin uh, fungicide products, which are very good at brown patch manage with brown patch control. So uh, you can look for those, and uh, if you decide to make a fungicide, or you may just have to do some overseeding this fall. All right, thanks, Lauren. Yours is a big one and not very pretty, John. You don't think this is pretty? This is a new cultivar of cabbage. It's oh. Swiss cheese cabbage. <laughs> uh, so th these are uh, cabbage leaves. I won't tell you which garden they came out of because they might have come out of my backyard. Mm -hmm. um, but you'll notice all of these holes in here, and there's a few things that do that. Uh, for all of the coal crops, uh, we have different pests. We call them collectively cabbage worms. Uh, there's a, an imported cabbage worm or imported uh, uh, little guy here, and there's one pupated on the back. We think uh, that he is uh, uh, ready to turn into a, a beautiful butterfly, uh, and he's a, a white butterfly. And then, if we can find little teeny tiny uh, worms on here, let me try to find them. I just saw one, but they are very minute, uh, really teeny tiny. Oh, one just fell off. I'm chasing around my cabbage looper. Uh, uh, right there on my hand. So these guys will eat all coal crops, so cabbage, broccoli, kale. Uh, it's a bigger issue on kale because the leaf is the part that you want to eat. Uh, so you need to control that. So there's a few products you can do. So we've mentioned BT, uh, which is a, a good organic solution. Uh, it uses a bacteria. Uh, there's also another bacteria that you can use. It's more broad spectrum. Uh, it's called uh, spinosad. Uh, and so that's what I've been using. Uh, just started uh, recently uh, so that you can uh, just sprinkle this on. You have to reapply after it rains, of course. But basically the bugs uh, get this in their digestive system. It gives them a tummy ache. They don't eat anymore, and then they die. So it's all it's all the circle of life. <laughs> <Perfect>. <laughs> right. All right. Thank you, John. All right, Jody. Uh, it is Insect Central this yes. week, so you have a pile of them. The first one here is a great picture on the bottom of a zucchini leaf. Appears to be just hatching. This is rural western Oto County. What is this, and what will it become? These are stink bug eggs and nymphs, and um, I think, are these ones, if there's ones that have a little white on their antennae, wait, Odo County, I mm -hmm. think these ones could be the green stink bugs. I'm not really sure, but they are um, damaging to like flowers and crops, fruits, things like that. Mm -hmm. So these might not be good guys, depending on uh, what's around there. If you've got a lot more gardening things, they don't usually, there's other things that feed on zucchini. Okay. So. All right. And your second one is Omaha. Found these little guys on a leaf of a 30-year-old yeah. sunset maple. Uh, wonders what they are and are they harmful? Okay. So these are brown marmorated stink bugs. These are the ones that have the white um, um, little band on the antennae. Um, these are pretty harmful to a lot of crops, fruits, nuts. Um, so around the home, though, they are known for overwintering in houses. So they are pretty pesky and they're an invasive species. So you will probably want to dump those in soapy water. So if you see those, um, I would get rid of those too. All right, and your third one is she found this on her hosta. Oh yes, these came out this week and they are super damaging and they like to hang out in groups. They're like social eaters, you know, just like, just like <laughs> me, I suppose. Um, they will destroy everything. Um, but the, this is an ash gray blister beetle, and you'll want to pick these off because they're pretty big. Um, they look like an upside down exclamation point, but um, they do cause blisters if you um, squish them, so you want to wear gloves. All right, thanks, Jody. So it is insects versus plant world, right? Yeah, now. those ones are all bad, sorry. <laughs> all right, so you have a couple weed IDs, Matt, since you can do that. It's oh, yeah. one nice of boy. our other turf guys. <laughs> Try. <laughs> this is a Lincoln viewer. This is actually the first picture we've gotten of this particular weed this year. She's seeing it both in her flower beds and in the turf. 
Yes, and this one is a day flower, Asiatic day flower, mm -hmm. I believe, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, so, and this one gets its name because it only blooms, each bloom is only for a day, and it's an annual. So the way it spreads in your lawn is that it, it basically roots at each node of the plant. So if it lays down and there's moisture there, it's gonna root into the ground and it's just gonna keep spreading. Mm -hmm. uh, so the best way to do it is to pull it out. There isn't too many, I mean, you can spray it with herbicides, but if they're in the landscape where your, all your other flowers are, it's probably not the best idea. Mm -hmm. uh, so pulling it out is, is the best way to do it. And if you don't do it soon enough, uh, those seeds can last for about four years in the soil. So you wanna make sure you get them before they're blooming, which is every day. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and your second weed here is a South of Hickman viewer. This clover-like plant with little yellow flowers. Yes, the little yellow flowers. And this <laughs> one is called yellow wood sorrel or mm -hmm. oxalis. Um, and it is also a summer annual. So this one, actually, if you want to eat the leaves on this one, it tastes like sweet tarts. Mm -hmm. So you can just, mm -hmm. you know, munch mm -hmm. on it. Or <laughs> if you want to get rid of it, uh, a lot of the products containing either fluoroxapyr or triclopyr work really well on it. Uh, you want to get it before it seeds out because it makes a lot of, it makes almost like a banana-like structure. And when the seeds are ripe, it actually pops and it spreads the seed all over. So you want to make sure you get it before it gets those structures. Otherwise, pull it out and get rid of it. All right. Thank you, Matt. Yep. Okay, they Lauren, you have sweet tarts. They are. Sweet they tarts. Sweet tarts. Yeah. I never thought of it that way. I think it tastes like lemon, mm. but mm -hmm. maybe it's a lemon sweet tart. Do you Could try be. all the ones? Yeah, it must be a different variety. <laughs> there you go. All right, Lauren, you have uh, a couple of raspberry questions. The first one, this is a four-year-old heritage raspberry stand. Last year and this year, the leaves are curling up on about half the canes. Um, he's wondering if it's a virus. And they do, they do get viruses as the plants are older and depending on where you got your, or purchased your original stock, um, it can be contaminated. Uh, so if you do see that and it is isolated um, you could remove that, but there's a real good chance it's starting to spread through the bed. So you just, you're gonna have to really be careful with that, but we're really roguing that out if it is a virus is the best way to deal with it. The other thing that comes to mind with this is depending on how that plant's growing and what's adjacent to uh, the planting, those roots can grow into any herbicide. So if you had, you know, for example, if it was on the edge of a property and a neighbor applied a herbicide, you may even have some root system growing into that that can result in spotty, uh, distorted growth that way. All right, and your second one is actually, um, they live in Hastings. The original plants came from Sutton. They're black raspberries, abundance of flowers. They, they're pollinated, but they don't produce fruit. The berries stay hard and dry. Yeah, and, and this one, I, you know, I don't know. It, it almost looks like a, a poor pollination scenario, and some of them have individual mm -hmm. pollinated points on them, it looks like. Uh, so I, I don't really think this is a disease. Mm -hmm. from, from what I see in the picture. So I don't know, if John, are there other things that, that would be poor pollination that could cause that too? I mean, it could be poor pollination. It could be uh, like excessive heat. Sometimes that will damage fruit, um, yeah. cause the, that, kind of, that kind of loss. Um, I mean, there are diseases that affect fruits, but you would usually, they would end up more like squishy and fuzzy looking yeah. rather than the hard, dry. I'm thinking mm -hmm. it's pollination yeah. or heat. Typically wouldn't see 100% with a disease either, right, no. so that really right. kind of rules it out. All right, thanks guys. Okay, John, you have a tomato world. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Your first two are actually, uh, they're from different locations. The first is Northeast Iowa near Manchester, and the second one uh, is Stromsburg, and they're, those tomato plants both look about the same. So uh, what are we going on? What's going on with the, the curling on these? So as you can see, we have some leaf curling there, uh, and there's a few things that can cause that. Um, so that uh, phenomenon is called epinasty, mm -hmm. uh, which is one of those, you know, million dollar words, you know. <laughs> and uh, so basically it's a hormonal imbalance in the plant that is caused by something that causes the top of the leaf to grow faster than the bottom of the leaf. Um, one of the causes could be herbicide damage, which is common. Uh, however, there's another clue uh, that we've had a lot of rain mm -hmm. recently. And when plants, especially tomatoes and other plants, get really wet roots, they really don't respond well to that. And this is a symptom of excessive soil moisture as well. So I think it looks more like too much water than herbicide I damage. Think so too. And your third and fourth ones are also the same, and they 
our tomatoes with those beautiful big black spots that people think belong to Lauren. <laughs> Right. Yes. So you, you, uh, people will call in and say my tomato has a blight, and, right. and they show me this picture or they right. describe it, uh, and this is a disorder, not a disease. Mm -hmm. So Lauren gets a pass mm -hmm. uh, from this one. So this most likely is also caused by a water issue. Mm -hmm. uh, so what happens is uh, for fruit structures to to form and be solid, they need calcium. There's a calcium deficiency in the plant. People take that to mean there's a calcium deficiency in the soil, but that is usually not the case. It is either irregular watering, so too much water damages the root hairs on the roots and the plant can't take up calcium, or too little water and the plant can't take up enough calcium. Uh, so those are the major causes, or uh, too much fertilization and the plant grows so fast that it can't take up enough calcium to support the fruit. Okay, cut it out and enjoy the rest of it in your BLT. Yes. Okay. Blossom and rot lettuce tomato. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You know, learning to garden is really a big part of an innovative program helping Lincoln area families. The story of growing great beginnings is from NET producer Mike Tobias and his new What If series. What are you planting today? So we've got green beans, carrots, broccoli, cauliflower. It's the second year Jess Parker and her kids, Ryland, Silas, and Christian, have planted a backyard garden. This garden is part of Growing Great Beginnings, a unique Lancaster and Saunders County's Community Action Partnership project. It helps people living in poverty, living on a tight budget, learn how to grow their own food and plan and cook healthy meals. Different because it's melding all these things into one package something Community Action created because they couldn't find anyone else doing it. Are they ready? Tap right there. Okay, good job, you got it. One of the things that we know um, with families in our program is that over half of them told us that on a regular basis, they run out of food and they don't have money to buy more. So uh, being able to grow your own food um, and then bring it into your kitchen obviously helps with the cost, um, but as we are able to teach people more skills in the kitchen. They can um, purchase foods that are healthy but less expensive than some of those foods that are more convenience foods that they know their children are eat. Jess and kids live below the poverty level, $2,000 a month for a family their size. They've seen tough times. My fiance, my children's dad, died in 2016 unexpectedly. And then almost exactly a year later, I was diagnosed with cancer. Um, and dealt with cancer. Jess earned a little money working at a child care, but raising three kids is her full-time job. Living in her dad's house helps. Concepts like meal planning were foreign before the family started growing great beginnings a few years ago. Originally, I was going to the store sometimes twice or three times a day because it would just be like, what do you guys feel like eating? Like, oh, mac and cheese, okay, let's run to the store and get it. And the other thing that emerged out of those first visits was um, she had this sense of just being exhausted from just making meals. Good one. All right, let's get another one, okay? Stratton started meeting with Jess at her house, helping her plan meals, cut shopping trips to three a week or less, and start a home garden. When kids really become engaged with their food and have that opportunity to plant a seed and watch it grow and water the plants and harvest the vegetable, they're much more likely to want to try this new thing. Two months later, the garden is putting zucchini boats, cauliflower mashed potatoes, and cucumber salad on the table. She got the kids involved in the meal planning from the get-go, and you, I mean, you can kind of see the wonderful outcome of that. Jess shops less, spends less. Maybe $15 to $20 per day then, and maybe $5 to $10 a day now. I think we've had really um, some positive results in seeing um, a reduction in sugary beverages that children are drinking, an increase in fruits and vegetables. Uh, we also have seen children be getting more sleep at home. So this has to simmer for 15 minutes. So this is gonna be really hot, okay? It'll be easier to eat, to pick it up and eat it. And after years of facing challenges, Jess Parker has new goals. 
<laughs> I hope to write my own cookbook with my kids and I hope that my kids would learn more skills in the kitchen as they grow older. This is one of the best meals ever. Mm -hmm. You like it? Mm -hmm. There's always opportunity and you just have to find it and use it and go with it. Thank you guys for making it. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Check out more stories on innovation and creativity on the What If website, netnebraska.org slash what if. Pretty cool. Get those kids to grow it and eat it. Get them started early. Get them started weed early. It. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> weed. Okay, you have a couple more pictures. Th these are so cool. This is the insect burrows. These one-inch burrows appear. And what is it? I'm glad you think these are cool. They are I cool. Do so think these are cool. antlion pits. Yeah. And it's funny because the entomologists, uh, the association is doing the antlion pit as opposed to the shark tank. So that's how cool antlions are to entomologists. <laughs> but you don't usually see these. So this is the larvae that make these pits. So if you actually looked at them, they're little funnels, probably about like two inches deep, three inches wide. And there's this little thing with like jaws, <laughs> and it's underneath there, the funnel. And it's called an antlion. The larvae is called a doodle bug, so it's not very fierce, but the ant lion waits for an ant to fall in the funnel and then it eats it. It's kind of awesome. It turns into an adult, which is not really that great. I mean, it looks like a damselfly, mm -hmm. which is pretty, but the, the larvae is pretty awesome. Cool. And your second one is, would you please identify this bug? And he's got things. Yeah, is... so this is the adult <laughs> of a Dobson fly and it's a male. So the males, um, so these guys only live a week. And actually, these two things you don't need to control for, let's just say, that's how cool they are. And so this will live a week. You'll, you're seeing these because there's probably some porch lights on. I know I'm getting super excited. So the male <laughs> uses that because that's how he like courts, because he's got like big mandibles, right? And then he uses that for mating. Hmm. But, um, so that's a Dobson fly male. The larvae are aquatic and they're called helgramites. They're predators underwater. Cool. Very Insects cool are stuff. Very they won't bite your finger off. Mm, well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't put your know, finger no out idea. there, Matt. <laughs> All right, you have a couple of big weed pictures, and again, they're weeds because you yeah. do weeds. The first uh, one, nice. we've gotten lots and lots of pictures on this. Um, so some people grow it. We have, I think, three pictures of this particular weed. I think, yeah, this one, it looks like pokeweed. Mm -hmm. And this one also looks like pokeweed. So there's, so there's a couple there's, different yeah. types of them. This yeah. one, too, they have that white, uh, structure on the end, which is actually going to be the, I don't know, is it more of a berry or the flower? And flowering? then it turns into these. Yep. Yep. And yep, it turns. Yep. Does the, the stems sometimes are reddish also? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I don't know. If the one way to remove this is if if you think it's a weed, is to basically dig it out because it has a good root system, and you're not going to kill it by just chopping them off. It's going to keep regrowing. Mm -hmm. And your second one, we went back and forth, and. Uh, Finally decided this is what. Yeah, so this one I think is actually a elderberry, mm -hmm. so it's a little different than any of the other ones, I guess. Especially too, if you think it's like kind of a hemlock plant where it's got that white uh, flowering top mass. Uh, the difference is that this one is not going to be kind of poisonous like hemlock is. Or there's another one that giant you were, hogweed. Giant hogweed. Yeah. So there's a couple other ones that may have that similar big white uh, flowering structure on top. But in the end, this one will actually turn to little tiny purple berries, mm -hmm. and you can actually make wine out of it. And I don't know, there's probably other jams and stuff you can make out of that one. Exactly. Elderberry. Exactly. Yes, it's good right. stuff. Tastes like candy. Right. See? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Right. It, like, it doesn't taste like candy. It's wine very, first. Very bitter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Jill. All right. Good. Thanks, Matt. Okay, so <clears throat> your set of pictures here is a viewer uh, who had considerable hail damage and the Austrian pines have now started doing this. We had actually many of these, uh, Lauren, that came in with, is this possible for disease based on hail damage? Yeah, so the challenge I have when I look at this is not to get as excited as Jody was looking at her, <laughs> her bugs because I know this the homeowner doesn't like to see this, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna control myself here. But, um, yeah. This is Spheropsis tip blight, and it, it's pretty severe in, in this particular situation, and you can see the, the candles or the end of those shoots at the end of the branches are about half elongated, and then they stop growth, and that's because there's a fungal infection in that at the base. So when you're managing this, um, you want to really look at uh, managing it when those candles are elongating next spring. 
Uh, so that would be it'd be the recommendation, you know, if you want to control it. Uh, hail does make this worse for sure. Mm -hmm. So if you had hail, that would mm -hmm. definitely make it worse. And I think we had two or three uh, viewers send in questions, could the hail do this? In the Absolutely, because yeah. wounding will mm -hmm. definitely improve, the, increase that, and especially at those earlier stages of development for the right. candles. Right, it's also once it's got it, it's going to be there, and it's always going to be there. So those, and then the, the actual, uh, the fungus will also overwinter um, on cones and things like mm -hmm. that. So you're always going to have a, a lot of inoculum or seeds for disease present. Uh, so if you really want to control it, you're probably looking at some sort of a, you know, a fungicide application at about half elongation next spring for those candles or those young needles, and then again at about three-quarter elongation. All right. Thanks, Lauren. All right, John, since you love trees so much, you have two tree questions, okay. <laughs> both of which are pruning. Uh, this is actually a royal frost birch, which is a little unusual in this part of the country. Uh, she's wondering whether it needs some pruning, and if so, when? So if you take a look at that, you see sort of those wild bedhead branches, you know, sticking out. Mm -hmm. uh, and you might want to, mm -hmm. to, to shape that up, be a little more shapely, because as the tree grows, it'll sort of you know, have these weird shapes as it keeps going. So you can do some heading back, just getting sort of those those weird branches, making it more even all the way around. Uh, and for light pruning like that, you can do that anytime. You can do that really now. Right, and birch is actually summer pruning, then yes. the bleeding is not quite so obvious. Yep. All right, your second one is a weeping willow, and this one's only four to five years old. This is in York County, and that's even worse bedhead. <laughs> right, so <laughs> it is, you know, mm -hmm. don't let your, your trees grow up to have bed head. Uh, you want to sort of prune that back uh, as well to shape it up, give it a nicer shape. Uh, you'll want to, to sort of have that in control as the tree grows up so that you have a nicer form of a tree. Uh, and you can go ahead and do that now as well. Good, and I would refer our viewers to the segment that Jeff did that was on pruning after the, the storm when we had all the all the branching to take some of that weight off too. Right. So good, thanks John. You know, with all the moisture and warm weather we've been having, our garden is now growing like crazy. And with that have come a few very uninvited guests. Let's take a few minutes to hear from Terry James out at the Backyard Farmer Garden. This week in the Backyard Farmer Garden, we're gonna check things out again. We're always talking about good practice, uh, good scouting, integrated pest management, and we're really looking at it this week in the Backyard Farmer Garden because we have Japanese beetle in the garden. We're constantly walking through the garden looking for the Japanese beetle with our little tub of water and soap in hand, and we're shushing them into that water and getting rid of them that way. We're also seeing the squash vine borer adults flying around. So we're keeping an eye on all of our zucchini and summer squash and melons and that kind of stuff and making sure that we're not seeing any kind of infestation in those stems at the ground level for them. And we're also seeing those eggs of the squash bugs. So we're checking underneath the leaves, finding those eggs. We're either squashing them, getting rid of the leaf and getting rid of the egg or however you're getting rid of it, that's up to you. Uh, you can use you know, some insecticidal soaps or neem oils or those kinds of things. But here in the backyard farmer garden, we're just kind of doing it the old fashioned way and using our finger and kind of squashing those eggs. So stop by the backyard farmer garden and check out and see what's growing in the backyard farmer garden. You know, we don't spray any chemicals in our gardens, so the struggle is real. We're gonna be fighting those pesky bugs for the next few months. When you see them, pick them off and squish. Get those questions in, and while you are doing that, we will see who wins this week's lightning round. It's going John's to going to? Yeah. Okay, I didn't give you no. enough. I'm gonna make some up. All right, here we go. <laughs> so this is a Valentine viewer, John. Um, has wild violets that does, she does not want and is wondering whether if she sterilizes the compost to 180 degrees, will that kill the seeds of those wild violets? That'll kill most everything in the compost, yes. <laughs> All right. This is an Omaha viewer who has a coral bell, a particular one that has cupped leaves, but the rest of hers do not. Is that herbicide damage or could that be genetic or both? Uh, it could be both. It could be too much water as well. There's lots of 
causes. All right. All right. Uh, a Lincoln viewer has the little sun gold uh, cherry tomatoes. They ripen and then they split in one day. What is going on with that? <clears throat> that could also be too much water. So too much water comes up and the little tomato splits. It can't take it all. All right. Uh, one of our viewers has a six-year-old coffee tree and one of the branches <clears throat> has yet to leaf out. Is that a goner? Probably at this point. All right, this is a viewer who wonders whether they can go ahead and mow off their peonies right now or do they need to wait until fall? You should wait until they die down and then you can prune them back. Maybe All right. not mow them as much. <clears throat> All right, uh, if the broccoli has already gone to head, is do we tear it out and start over unless it's the new one? Unless it's the new one, okay. Uh, if it's already gone to seed, you don't wanna eat that. You wanna replace it and that's perfect time to replace it. Perfect, All right. not bad. Ready, Lauren? You can give me say some yes, yes no's. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to use too, too much, much too much water in my answer. <laughs> yes, too much water. That applies right. in a lot of places, unfortunately. Yeah, here we go. Still. Absolutely. All right. Uh, this is an Omaha viewer who who has rows worth of potatoes that are showing diseased foliage. And will that affect the tubers of those potatoes? Depends on what it is. It, it could. Uh, many of them will cause soft rots in in the actual tubers. All right, uh, this is a viewer who still is getting mushrooms in their turf mm -hmm. and wants to spray them with something so they will stop. Sorry, there's really not an option for that. Just manage what they're feeding on is the best thing you can do. All right. Maybe Are there... too much thatch, maybe some thatch control. Okay. Manage. Are there any specific diseases of clematis that would cause the stems to turn brown or black and croak? Yes. <laughs> this is a viewer who has uh, yellow mushrooms in a container that has hibiscus in it. It's second year for it. Does she need to replace the soil so those mushrooms will not appear? If she wants to get, if you want to get rid of the mushrooms, yes, but they're probably going to be growing on the root material and, and with the plants. So it's going to be really hard to get rid of that. All right. This is a Holdridge viewer whose garlic rotted. Is that disease or potentially wet soil? Could be. <laughs> <laughs> we have a viewer who has pale green second year needles on their spruce. Is that disease or is that too much water? Pale green second year needles on their spruce. Um, it could be some natural needle drop. There's also needle cast diseases. Look for little structures on the needles. There'd be little dots on them if it is a needle cast. <laughs> All right. And the garlic, it, it, there's a lot, or the was it the garlic one? It could be too much water. It could be. Okay. There's a lot of things that could do yeah. that. So you didn't get that. Yeah. I kind of went because. No. Yeah, I'm just no, going to go ahead and go over. <laughs> that was our fault. You don't get a point no, on that no. one because that, yeah, that was a bonus question. Because no, okay. yeah. <laughs> we did not hear the lightning round sound in here, did we? No, I thought it was still going. I did too. Yeah. We got two keep... minutes. Yeah. We all one. <laughs> yeah, you get half because you There's know the lightning, too much. But no thunder. All right. There was the lightning, but no thunder. Okay. All right, are you ready, Matt? Yeah. I'll do it, I'll do it for you. So this is an Oakland, Iowa viewer who wants to know what to put on the cut small stems of trees to kill them if we don't use Tordon. Uh, if you don't have any trees nearby, Roundup works as well at like a 50% concentration. All right. Um, this is a husband-wife battle over why should turf be cut high? Uh, depending on how high, but Generally, the more the more competition there is in the grass, which is let's say versus one versus two inches, it's going to be more competitive against uh, weeds and disease and all that stuff. It's not going to be a problem. Stop talking. Yeah. All right. So this Move is on. take your time, Matt. This is a Seward viewer uh, who thinks she has henbit. Still, is this a good time to spray? Uh, henbit should be dying right now. So if it's not henbit, and if you rub it in your fingers, it's probably ground ivy and then right. wait a little while before we control that because it's a little hot. Okay, this is a Wahoo viewer who wants to use Weed Be Gone for their Creeping Charlie right now, <coughs> yes or no? I'm not saying it's gonna control it, but it'll probably hurt it a little bit. <laughs> and there's the lightning yeah. and the thunder. Yeah. <laughs> nice job anyway. Okay, Jody, you ready? Um, okay. Okay. <laughs> Go for it. We have a viewer who wants to know when is the best time to clean the holes in your bee house? When they're empty. So if they've already emerged, then you can drill the new ones or clean them out with bleach. Perfect. 
This is a Blair viewer who wonders, is there such a thing as a zombie fungus that attracts flies? Yes, it, well, it attacks flies. It's like an entomopathic fungi, and it makes the flies go up to the top or the end. This is not gonna be a lightning round, it's good <laughs> for me. And it just like dies, and it spreads its spores, but it like takes, its, takes over its brain and like goes up to the top. You would like Zombie it, you would love it. Awesome. We'll talk about it. <laughs> okay, this is a Plattsmouth viewer who wants to know why there are so many butterflies. Oh, the painted ladies, uh, it's like another bloom. A couple years ago we had that, but they were migrating through, they're migratory species. Um, what do butterflies eat is another question. So adults will eat, feed the, on nectar of flowers. In the caterpillars of the painted ladies, they feed on thistle. All right, is an ichneumon wasp good? Wasp? Yes, good they are good. They have really long ovipositors so they can inject or deposit their eggs in the larvae of uh, longhorn beetles under Excellent. the bark. So John, you actually did win. I did. <laughs> yeah. so it's all because you asked Jody Let's the exciting questions. <laughs> right. That's, well, that's what I'm going to see every time I get so Don't we have excited. to give a little bit of clarification though because there could be some marital spatting going on out there. Yeah, that one, was my pressure. And, and I just, I, I really want to ask if, if they were to cut it really low, they'd have to impose more management, typically, yes, right? that is So true. they could, and it depends on what they're going for Well, and, and the look. Can... So if they're going low, they just need to do more, yeah, or they right. go high and they don't, but both could be right. Yes, right? that's true. Okay, all right. So, so in the in-between would be perfect. Yeah, Which is wherever exactly they wanted to be. Right in between, our house, it's too tall. In our house, so <laughs> one person nope. mows. Yeah. Me. So you win, you can decide, <laughs> I win. You decide how tall it is, exactly. or if it doesn't get mowed. Exactly. <laughs> All right, John, what do we have for Plants of the Week? So we have several Plants of the Week, so you might notice these giant marigolds here, and that is Big Duck. <laughs> so Big Duck Yellow and Big Duck Orange, I don't make these things up. <laughs> Uh, so th these are All America Selections winners, mm -hmm. uh, which if you didn't know, the Backyard Farmer Garden is a All America Selections display garden. And I have All America Selections trial gardens in Omaha for vegetables and we also have flowers. So we grow all the new things. <clears throat> uh, they're 36 inches tall. Uh, they're loaded with flowers and they're also loaded with Japanese beetles. And Jody, our insect friend here, uh, shared uh, this is what Japanese beetles do to leaves. Uh, so they're all over the marigolds and then they're in here somewhere. If I can shake them up. Just don't you know, let them out. Just don't let them out. Uh, but you know, we have our little Japanese beetle friends in here. Uh, I keep following the camera. There we go. Uh, so uh, they're in there, they're eating the marigolds. We also have sea holly, uh, which is this interesting spiky thing here. Those are the flowers, pollinators love them. They're really great tough plants for dry areas. And then we also have something edible. You had to throw something, you know, th from the vegetable garden in for me. So we'll take this out. This is Swiss chard, this is bright lights. So it has five different colors from yellow to orange to magenta and pink. Uh, it is also an all-American selections winner from way back. Uh, so you can uh, have your flowers. It's very beautiful in a landscape bed as well. And you're gonna eat it. There you go, <laughs> back to you. <laughs> Perfect, all right, thank you, John. All right, so Jody, you now have um, multiple pictures that are little creeping sorts of something or others, larva. The first is a Northwest Iowa viewer wonders what this little guy is. Found it while picking red currants. They hope it's a good guy. Sorry, it's <laughs> cute. It's a very cute guy, but these are little inchworms. Uh, I don't know the species. There's like 1,700 different kinds in North America, but they usually do turn into a moth that um, will lay eggs in those little caterpillars. Will destroy something. Flowers. All right, and so then we have a second one here that is, uh, this is actually a Japanese maple, and I was wondering whether those were little worms on it. They did say they had hail at the end of July, and is this tree a goner? I would say this tree is a goner. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's uh, little caterpillars. They, some of them look like it, but then some of them don't, and I'm not sure why they would all be resting on top like that. Okay, and then we have Fort Atkinson, and she has uh, found this cool little something or other. Yeah, so this is a, a well, I don't know scale, so it looks like a larger type of inchworm or um, looper, and it's just because of the way they, they walk, similar to, to the one that John had. But bigger, this one looks like a stick mimic, but it's called a stout span worm moth caterpillar. Um, 
I don't think it's completely damaging. It will feed on a lot of like shrubs and um, trees with broad leaves. All right, and then your last two pictures are a petunia with issues. And she sent us the picture of some of the damage and she also, and this is actually Red Willow County in McCook. She sent us the frass. Yeah, so um, feeding and frass, it, that, they come together. But so this is from a geranium budworm and that is the same as a tobacco budworm. Um, if you look really closely, sometimes you'll see the, I bet you that caterpillar is going to look very pink because they do take on the color that of what they're eating and they've got like little black horns. But um, yeah, when they're pretty big, you can pick them off, but they love petunias. All right, thank you, Jody. All right, you have uh, your first one, Matt, is a, a viewer that has yellow nut sedge in the lawn. Awesome. We know that's what it is. <laughs> she wants to know what it is and how you kill it now. Um, yeah, you can still kill it, but your odds are that there's gonna be more next year, so you're gonna have to kill it earlier next year. Um, there's only a couple products that work to take it out, uh, one of them being sedge hammer, another one Solero, and then uh, Dismiss is the third one. So there's three options. Um, I mean, there, it's you got to spray it now and then probably again in three weeks and you have to use a non ionic surfactant if you're using Sedgehammer or Solero. That way you can get into the plant, translocate through the plant. All right, and your next one is interesting. It's a grass ID from way south. She really liked this and wonders what this one is. I think she sent us a couple different yeah. pictures. Yeah, of it. this one is south. Uh, Seashore Pest Palum is the one. And it is a warm season grass and it only grows in this tropical areas or southern hem or southern part of the U.S., Texas, up to North Carolina, I believe, along the coast. And it is amazingly uh, salt tolerant. So you can actually water it with seawater or ocean water and it, it'll tolerate it. So that's one of its claims to fame, especially along the coast. Cool, but not here. Not here. Well, not grow here. It won't survive the cold winters. All right. Thank you, Matt. All right, Lauren, uh, rots and spots in your first two pictures are, this is north of Garland, a 10-year-old tart cherry has this problem going on within the last week or so. Lots of leaves doing this. Uh, same thing actually on peach. So I think the second picture here is peach. So this is cherry and the second mm. picture here is a peach. Cherry leaf spot, mm -hmm. I believe in this case. And, and with cherry leaf spot, um, and I think it can affect other stone fruits. This may be a different one in peach, mm -hmm. but similar management. So you, if you really wanted to control it, and it didn't look like in the peach you had that much, so right. I, I don't know if I'd worry about management on it. In a cherry, if it's really severe, you'd look at some spring or early season at petal drop uh, applications mm -hmm. with a fungicide. That would be where it's a, a cherry you're gonna eat. Make sure it's, it's a fruit tree spray schedule that you can sure use the fruit because a lot of our fungicides when you spray them on the fruit trees, then the fruit's not edible. So you need to be careful on that. Make sure you're following the label. Uh, and then you can use some sanitation to help reduce inoculum. So leaf raking can help. All right, and your third picture is apple. So here we go with this, almost 15 years old. This is in Bellevue. What are we seeing in the old crab apples and beautiful, apples? Beautiful, beautiful scab. Yeah, so lots of scab. <laughs> love so Jody, I can get, ex I can get excited about, about this a little bit. Uh, <laughs> in any event, this is one also that it's not gonna kill the tree. Um, but it can be really severe, and, and depending on what you're trying to do in your landscape, if you want to manage this one earlier in the season, much earlier, right when leaves are starting to emerge. All right, thank you, Lauren. John, this is a Murdoch viewer who has uh, capitata ewes, so the, the big pointed ones, a, a bunch of them, about 15 years old. Um, this one is really looking like it's got something going on. He says he hasn't seen anything that is insects or spider mites, and I think he sent us a couple of close-up pictures on this one as well. So what do we think on this? That's the, as we get closer, we see what's going on. Well, you've got a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, <laughs> there could be multiple problems. So one could be winter damage. So they're just slightly differently placed. Mm -hmm. So if there was uh, like extra wind that hit this tree during the winter, uh, or it dried out a little bit more. That could be uh, what happened for the winter damage, but it also does kind of look like spider mite damage. So I would get out there and take a look and see just to make sure that there aren't spider mites on there. Okay, all right, thank you, John. 
You know, answering your questions is really the foundation of our program. You have been so loyal over the years by watching our program and participating by letting us help you with your questions. The pictures are really what we rely on now to give you the best solutions to those questions. So we are going to take a few minutes to help you with tips to submit better pictures. As the saying goes, a picture's worth a thousand words, and in our case, a picture will help our experts figure out what is bothering your plants. You can describe a disease, insect, or environmental issue all you want, but a good picture will always be the best way for us to identify the issues. It all starts with taking a good picture, and if you follow a few simple suggestions, you could submit better pictures to Backyard Farmer. First off, you don't need to use the flash in most cases. Usually, there is enough light from the sun in your garden. Secondly, get as close as you can to your subject, but try to stay in focus. Most phones have a feature where if you touch the screen, it will focus in the area you're touching. Also, some phones offer a burst feature that allows you to take multiple shots just by holding down the picture taking button. You can take several shots at once and pick the best one to send in. There's no need to use any photo editing apps or software. You don't need to zoom or crop the picture. In some cases, that is done after you submit your picture to the show when necessary. Other tips include getting wider shots is okay, but we also need to see some close-up shots of the problem. For instance, if you've got yellow spots in your turf, it's okay to take a wider shot, but also include a close-up or two. Also, bigger is always better, so make sure your phone camera is set to the highest resolution. When shooting insects or other small objects, it's always a good idea to try to give them some scale, like including a coin or a small ruler in the picture. If there is a disease or insect damage, you can submit pictures of those as well. When you're done taking pictures, you can either transfer them to your computer or cloud account, pick the best ones, and attach them as JPEGs to your email to Backyard Farmer. Or, if you have the Facebook Messenger app, you can add them to your message. Don't forget to tell us as much as you can about the question you have, as well as where you live. If your pictures are fuzzy and out of focus, or the bug moved, or it's too wide for us to see what's happening, we won't be able to answer your question. It's best to keep trying until you get a good shot. And as we cannot get to everyone's question each week, better pictures will increase your chances of getting an answer. We want to help you grow things the right way, and with the help of a few pictures, we'll have the answers you're looking for. Keeping those things in focus will really always make the best pictures to submit. If it's not in focus for you, it certainly won't be in focus for us. So those are really great tips, and, and we really do appreciate your trying to give us good pictures. All right, we're going to bang these out because we're a little behind because we have so many pictures. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you have three again, Judy, uh, Jody. This is uh, Hearts of Gold Redbud to begin with. Um, several hang out on the stems, narrow, weird black things. What, it, what is that? Yeah, so these are redbud tree hoppers, and tree hoppers are actually really, really cool. They're tiny, but they've got these weird protruding things on their heads. So this one makes it look like a thorn. Mm -hmm. They are sap-sucking insects, but normally on red bud, they don't do enough damage that you would want to treat. So just keep monitoring for that. All right, the second one is uh, found some, this guy on red bud logs. Uh, wonders what this one is and did the red bud bring this one in? Mm, I, don't, I don't know. So this is the red-headed ash borer. So it's, right. it's one of our native ash borers. It also will, um, it, it attacks like stressed trees or recently um, felled trees with the, with the bark still on it. I know they do oak and hickory. I don't know about red, but I don't know if there's an ash tree nearby. So, I mean, it's only going to attack downed like firewood type stuff. All right, and the third is simply, what are these on red bud? Okay, so that's the same tree hopper. Mm -hmm. If you actually like go close to it, you'll see like little spots on its head, the, the weird head. I would say check it out, it's pretty cool. Mm. <laughs> you think they're all cool. The black dot. 
<laughs> All right. <laughs> so, Matt, you have a couple of lawn issues that uh, I deliberately gave you since Lauren had so many other issues. Well, and I defer to him. Oh, I know. And this the first one here <laughs> is brown the spots. zombie fungus colonizing yes. my brain. I'm not going to yep. be very good yep. the rest of the show. This is a Lexington viewer. It has brown spots in the lawn, what's causing it and how to treat it. So that's your first two pictures. And then, um, yeah, those two, what do you think that is? Yeah, that's, I was talking with Lauren a little bit about it too, and it's almost like a brown patch or necrotic green spot because you can see some of the green mm -hmm. in the middle still. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if there's much you can really do about that. Some of the products you mentioned earlier, but it's almost too late at this point. It's not gonna. Yeah. I mean, more like summer patch, they might want to get a yeah. sample identified yep. too. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So that would be a good thing to take into the extension mm -hmm. Yeah, because office. just looking at a brown patch is tough to tell what the actual pathogen is. Mm -hmm. and I'm. I'd, you'd have to send it to the lab. All right, and and uh, this next one is uh, Omaha area. Lawn looks like it's dying off, and he has three ornamental grasses in the backyard too that are also showing some of this sort of disease damage. And I think he's, yep, there's another picture there. Yep, and this one too is a little bit of brown patch with maybe some leaf spot on it. And that was mm -hmm. kind of what Lauren was thinking. And so I'm gonna, Defer to him a little more. He's a lot better on the diseases. But same thing with this one. If you wanted to clarify what it is, you're going to have to send it in. But um, with any any type of fungus in a lawn or setting, uh, you want to look back at what you're doing for watering. With this heat we're having, if you're watering every night and it's going to stay wet, you're keeping that leaf wet, uh, the best thing would be to, let's say, try and do it every other day or every third day uh, early in the morning. That way it's not wet all night, and that's going to help with your disease chances to prevent them just without spraying anything. All right, thank you, Matt. Okay, Lauren, her subject line was snake eggs. <laughs> so what is this? <laughs> and she's hoping it wasn't, as well, are snake you. Eggs. You can see they're not connected. I made that mistake already once in my life. <laughs> um, these, are, uh, these are stinkhorn ovules. So many times you'll find them in mulch, and uh, if you did dig a clump of that up, it would shoot out a little stinkhorn. Okay. And your next three pictures are uh, mildewy stuff in the yard. And she did send, you know, they... Slime mold. Yeah, slime Beautiful. mold. Beautiful. Yeah, Not doing so anything, just a gray, uh, you know, that gray discoloration. They come in different colors. You can, if you really, if they're bothering you, just take a hose and wash them off. All right, and they'll come back again in the... Yeah, they'll be the, there. Yeah, Don't but, eat them, they taste terrible. Yeah, so this particular <laughs> viewer, even without hearing how she should send in pictures, look at that. Wide, yeah. closer, and close nice, up. Nice, really That's good. Pretty nice. Good picks. Good. All right, so your pictures, you've got three of them, and this is a Crofton, Nebraska viewer, John. Northern Knox County, he took these along the ravines uh, along Lewis and Clark Lake. So they're blooming, there's the, there's the shrub itself, usually about eight feet tall, fine textured trunk, and the distant photos didn't show the flowers very well, so he sent some more. There's the foliage, and I, I think he did send one of the yeah. flower itself. So if you take a look at that, you would never tell if you had seen an, or another dogwood mm -hmm. that that is a dogwood. Mm -hmm. So that is probably gray dogwood. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's lots of different dogwood species. They have all different kinds of flowers. Uh, and that one has those tiny little flowers. Mm -hmm. uh, and dogswoods are interesting because those are not petals. Those are leaf uh, that change colors. The flowers are down in there. So it's cool. a gray dogwood. Yeah, that would be a gray and, it, and they'd be native up in that part of the mm -hmm. country. Well, we always have announcements of cool things in the gardening world. So our first announcement tonight is donate that produce to our master gardeners Tuesdays, 4.30 to 7 p.m. in the Backyard Farmer Garden, and we make sure that gets distributed to people that need it. I think we have a second announcement tonight, or maybe a third, and this is, of course, watching Digging Deeper with Backyard Farmer on Facebook, Sundays, 6.30 p.m. Central Time. And you can follow us, of course, uh, Backyard Farmer in NET Nebraska. So that's uh, also cool stuff in the gardening world because, of course, that is us. Yep. So we have time, I think, for a couple more questions. Uh, Jody, this one came from our phone panel. Ten-foot sunflower um, only has leaves, not flowers, and they were eaten overnight. <laughs> oh, that sounds like my flowers. Yeah. They may be sunflower head yeah. off. Yeah. So, so they're caterpillars that. Yeah. And and do Japanese beetles eat the leaves on sunflowers pretty dramatically they too? So if they're lacy, that's yeah. Okay. Three hundred different plants. <laughs> Not that anybody's counting. <laughs> right. Okay, Matt. We have time for All just right. one quick question for you, and that is: Is there a way to kill Virginia creeper in other broadleafs? What do we do about that? 
Oh, I don't know about that one. In other broadleaves, mm -hmm. uh, I would say you're going to have to probably pull that out somehow because mm -hmm. most herbicides will kill everything in there. All right, glove of death. Yes, glove oh, of death, yeah. Or maybe pull it out. A little bit of Roundup in there, spot right. spraying it.